Okay, so I think you can see the screen, right? Yes. So during the session, please do explain how. Okay, we will explain those things. In case of compiler on Linux, it is GCC. Yes, uh, by default, it is GCC. Okay, so let's start with the fundamentals of programming. So why should you should learn programming? Now, if we are talking about being in infosec, right? Let's suppose you are not in system development or system programming related fields. Let's suppose you're only in web pen testing or something, but you do not know programming. You can only rely on tools as long as those tools work properly. Once those tools do not work as expected, or there are some edge, edge case scenarios where the tools fail, then it becomes imperative either to write your own programs or to modify those existing tools given or taken that the source code is present. For example, let's suppose you are trying to exfiltrate some SQL injection uh, data from SQL injection vulnerability, but uh, SQL map is crashing for some reason. If you don't know programming, if you do not actually understand what goes in SQL exploitation and stuff like that, you will not be able to solve that problem. So this is the point that differentiates uh, normal hackers or normal professionals from very good professionals in our industry, right? So same goes with any other thing. For example, let's suppose you are doing reverse engineering or malware analysis. So until and unless you know how to program your debugger or because some debuggers come with scripting capabilities, right? So until and unless you know how to script your uh, environment, how to speed up your analysis, you are going to get limited. But once you are able to script things, you, once you are able to write your own scripts to analyze binaries, to analyze programs, to analyze malware, right? So what you can do is you can just automate every single thing. You might have heard about sandboxes, right? So what a sandbox does is it, it is basically an environment which executes the binary and records everything it does and produces a report. So that thing can be done by hand. And before sandboxes, that was done by hand. But Sandbox is one of the applications where you can just write a code or you can write something that you know does all the analysis work and produces a report, basically allowing you to analyze something between one to a hundred or a thousand malwares per day where you were stuck with, had you not had the Sandbox, right? You would have been stuck with analyzing a single malware for multiple days. So this is why you should learn programming. Now, another thing what programming helps in is uh, programming provides you a proper structure to thinking or to a thought process. So when you learn programming, you learn to think in a proper structured manner. And once you know the structured manner, because at the end of the day, if you are going to automate anything, if you're going to automate your um, burp suite or um, anything, right? It can be debugger, it can be decompilation, it can be uh, data exfiltration, it can be uh, pivoting and um, anything, right? It can be basically anything. So the thing is, it has to be done by the computer. And since it has to be done by the computer, it must be told to the computer in a specific way. And to tell computer to do something, that is basically programming. So the more you know about programming, the more experience you have of programming, the better you are going to be in your domain or in your field, right? So I think you all get the point why we do need the programming part, right? Okay, so uh, moving ahead now, how to design your programs? The next question is how to design your program. So when designing programs, we have multiple approaches and which we call basically multiple paradigms. So multiple paradigms have, we, we have paradigms in terms of programming languages. For example, procedural language, functional language, object-oriented object or programming languages and things like that. However, in terms of program design, you can say, uh, you can either start with a bottom-up approach or you can use a top-down approach. So in a bottom-up approach is when <clears throat> you take the problem and you come to the smallest point, right? You come the most fundamental thing and you start building things. For example, let's suppose you are trying to build a computer. So the most fundamental thing would be a circuit, right? So you start with circuits. You build circuits, you do stuff, 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 and then finally you create memory and then you finally, and then you create storage, then you 
connect those things, and then you create a computer. So that is the bottom up approach. Or else, right? So another thing is the top down approach. So top down approach is where you start from the very top, and you uh, break it down in multiple things. For example, you start with taking the same computer approach. Uh, we see that there is memory, there's the memory is then hard disk or in, uh, the runtime, not the runtime memory, the memory which is used as RAM, right? So the secondary memory or the primary memory, right? And the primary memory, after the primary memory, we have different types of memory. So for example, uh, we have caches and after the caches, we have registers, right? And registers are again built of different logic circuits. So the, in the top-down approach, you start from the very top and then you keep dividing the problem into different sub problems. And at the end, you end with a problem uh, which can be solved, right? So you, at the end of the day, once you have identified the very basic problem, you create a function to solve that problem. And then you just combine those approaches. So bottom up, bottom up approach is usually uh, in most cases used by object oriented programming though you can use bottom up or top down approach with almost uh, any other programming style now bottom approach is usually used by uh, i would say object oriented programming whereas c usually uses top down approach and as i said you can in most cases use any of the approach until unless there are some serious difficulties right now the choice depends upon how hard it would be some problems are easy to solve in top-down approach, some problems are easy to solve using bottom-up approach. And therefore, it is uh, essential for you to understand uh, what the bottom-up approach is and what the top-down approach is and where to use which one. So once we, uh, once you have figured out uh, which approach to take, we are going to think about something else, which is scalability. So what is scalability? Now, scalability is something which uh, lets you do things or scalability is the process which lets you scale so to scale is to grow for example <clears throat> let's suppose uh, you were running a fuzzer or you were running uh, you were fuzzing a file on your system so most people have one laptop was computer you can fuzz on a single computer but let's suppose you want to analyze uh, you want to run fuzzing on a large scale so what you can do is you can buy additional storage you can buy uh, cloud storage and then you are running fuzzing on uh, cloud machines for example you have 10 machines on the cloud or you have 10 virtual machines on your cloud and you are then fuzzing on those 10 machines uh, 10 machines which will ultimately increase the output because now you are at the very least doing more work than you were before so that is scalability and why we should care about it is because you should be designing your programs in a way which if scaled would work properly because in case uh, you do not care about scalability and you write a program but uh, then it uh, for some reason you need to scale it right let's suppose you are in a company or let's suppose your project needs to work on multiple machines so if you have not designed it in a way which is scalable then you might need to rewrite it again because you need scalable, right? If you take the scalability properly, if you take the design, uh, if you make the design scalable from the very beginning, then there would be no problem and you can scale properly without any problems, right? So those were the fundamentals of programming. Can you help me understand what is the horizontal scaling and vertical scaling? Uh, unfortunately, I do not know more much about the difference between horizontal scaling and vertical scaling what i'm talking about is um, just in, uh, okay so i don't know much about i don't know difference between horizontal scaling versus vertical scaling but what i am talking about is at a certain point you have to you know move things about for example you were using a program which was then converted or which was then used as an API. So you need to think about that way, right? I think I would be able to tell them, let's see what is the difference at horizontal scaling versus horizontal scaling and vertical scaling. 
Okay, so the most basic answer is horizontal scaling means you add more machines, and vertical scaling means you add more power. So horizontal scaling would be okay. So horizontal scaling would be uh, instead of using a single machine for fuzzing, you are using two, three, or four machines. Whereas vertical vertical scaling is you increase the capacity of your existing machine. For example, it has more RAM or it has a better CPU. Instead of i5, you replace the CPU with i7 or i9. So that is what I can find out, right? Uh, could you please uh, also talk about optimization of code in terms of code lines, memory processing power? Okay, so I think you need uh, everyone is having. Okay, no one is no one is having any problems in the sound. So I think you need to start. You need to check your output. Okay, so as for the optimization of code in terms of code lines, memory processing power. So okay, so optimization can be done in terms of either processing or in terms of memory. So memory optimization is what we talk about, or it is time complexity. No, uh, memory optimization is actually space complexity. So how much space does your program take at the runtime? So for example, if you have something which is, uh, if you have you have an iterative process, or you have a task which is done via iterations, so you can either use loops, or you can do the same task via recursion. So if you employ loops, it would be less memory uh, eating power. But if you employ, I would say recursion, it would take more memory because of the additional stack frames, local variables, calls, and those things. Now, specifically talking about code lines, processing power, those things uh, we can discuss in separate topics. For example, we can discuss those things in separate uh, sessions where uh, we can have the session on just standalone optimization. For example, like how to optimize your programs. I think that would do. As far as uh, as far as the basic or by default optimization goes in, GCC provides you, or I think most compilers provide you with uh, default switches through which you can uh, enable what level of optimization do you want, right? So GCC provides you multiple options. Uh, O0 as the by default optimization, which is zero default optimization. O1, O2, O3, I think O3 is the highest. Then we have something by the term OS, which optimizes for space. So it again depends on compiler version. Compiler version, for example, <coughs> my compiler version is 9.3.0, right? So let's suppose my compiler version was 8.1. So that happens uh, when the compiler differences occur, the optimization algos differ, and therefore same options might yield or will yield different results. In most cases, right? So those things are kind of dependent. If you if we are talking about the optimization in terms of compiler options, those things depend on compiler version, right? So let's uh, talk about other things. So let's start with C, right? So starting with C, the first question is why C, right? Uh, because we all have different backgrounds, and in most cases, we all have exposure to different languages. We all have done some Python. We all have done some C, C++, uh, PHP, JavaScript, HTML, and basically any other language, right? The question is why C? And the simplest answer would be because I was interested in taking a session on C. I was not interested in any other language for the same reason because, I mean, why not, right? Another reason is since my primary purpose was to bridge the gap between uh, the low level things which require you the understanding of system APIs, which are usually defined or exposed basically in terms of C. For example, the Win32 API, basically the native Windows API or uh, the Linux ABI. So the thing is in most cases, uh, operating system native tasks are usually talked about or uh, implemented in C related like, functionality. Malwares are usually written in C or C++ for the efficiency and for the power reasons. You just, you can write a malware in Python that would be stupid because the sheer size of it would be 5 MB, 6 MB, 4 MB is because it would have to, you know, bind its interpreter and at the end of the day it is interpretation mechanism. So that is very bulky and nobody wants that thing. 
So if you are analyzing a malware, let's suppose you are doing the job of a malware analyst. So what happens is at the end of the day, without decompilation feature or even with decompilation feature, right? So what happens is you are looking at assembly and the system calls have definition or usage criteria in C or C++ in most cases. So you have to make a relation with how it would look in C. And therefore we are learning YC, right? Okay, so the question is, do you use C or C++? It depends, I use multiple languages. I have exposure to something around 15, 20 languages. But again, exposure does not mean I can do every language very well. At a certain point, uh, you do experience various things. For example, if I count the years I have experience of programming, I have been programming for last 15 to 16 years. So in those 15 to 16 years, I have programmed in around 20 languages. For some languages, I programmed two months. For some languages, I programmed four years, 10 years. And now it, it really depends on the job. If I'm trying to write a script, which is going to do something, something on web applications or something else, I'm not going to write it in C, right? But if something is very well uh, used or programmed through C, then I will be using C or C++, it depends, right? So text editors, IDs, and compilers. Now we are, why are we discussing these things? Because some people confuse text editors with IDs and compilers. Yeah, for some reason it happens, right? A uh, text editor is a program in which you will write your code. For example, let's make a directory, C. Okay. okay, so we are in C. So a text editor is something such as this, which is basically, this is a notepad kind of thing. Kate is a text editor for Qt based uh, sessions or Qt DE for Linux. In Windows, we have Notepad as a text editor. A text editor is something where you write or you edit some form of text. In terms of command line text editors, we have Vim, V, Nano on Linux, right? An IDE, on the other hand, is an integrated development environment. So an integrated development environment is something which provides you a lot of tools for basically development, right? So it is a whole and it is a whole environment. And by environment, I mean is if you talk about something, let's suppose we are talking about Visual Studio. So Visual Studio provides you all the tools. It provides you <coughs> autocomplete features. It provides you various other things. Uh, it provides you native environment. It provides you easy access to the APIs. It provides you build tools. It provides you debugging environment. It provides you everything, right? So that is the task of an IDE to ease you into development and to provide a complete development environment. So you do not just write random text and hoping it would work or something like that. An IDE is a full blown thing, right? So I think I have code. Okay, I don't have code here. I had VS code last time. Okay, we don't need any. Uh, ID for now, right? A compiler is, I think you all <coughs> familiar, you all are familiar with. Okay, Tushar raised hand. Yes, Tushar, can you please type or should we unmute you? Let me see if we can unmute you. Okay, that was a mistake. So talking about compiler. So compiler is a program which will <clears throat> take your source code and then convert it to an executable. For example, since we are using C, so GCC is a compiler and GCC is a GNU, C or C++ compiler, which by default does is you pass it a .c file, source code file, and it will generate an ELF file for the operating system to execute. The basic task of a compiler is to turn the human human readable source code into machine readable executable, which your operating system can process and can be directly executed by your microprocessor. Now let's start with the first C program. So let's start with hello, right? So
so I'm using sublime text here you can use sublime text or anything else whatever works for you right so printf Okay, so let's compile it. To compile it, we provide the name of the file to GCC. And if we press enter, if there are any errors, they will be shown by GCC. Now, by doing an ls, we see there's another file a dot out, which is the ELF file generated by the GCC. What we can do is, if we do not want the name is a dot out, we can be like GCC hello world and minus o the output file name which is hello right so we have two files and let's see both are pretty much the same thing let's run the hello and it says hello world, right so that is the basic first program of c and i think everybody understands that thing but the question is what are the components of a c program so a c program is divided into few or several components let's see what are those just a second. So this first part is called the preprocessor, but this is the preprocessor directive, and it will be processed by the C preprocessor. So why do we need stdio.h? So this is a header file to be honest, right? So this is the header file, and we are including this header file as uh, the part of compilation because the printf function is defined inside the stdio.h file. So to use printf, we have to include the stdio file. So before actually compilation, what happens is the C preprocessor will resolve all the all the preprocessor directives. And since it says include the stdio.h file, so it will include this file as a part of this program's code, and then we will have a reference to printf. Right, so that way we do not have to use the print. Uh, we do not have to write our code for printf. Now, besides the preprocess directives or preprocessor stuff, for example, that include files or header files, uh, we can have multiple functions. For example, let's suppose we have a function one, we have a function two, and other things, right? So we can have multiple functions, but at the end of the day, if it is an executable, basically, right? So we are not going into complexities that some files do not have a main function, some files do, right? So every file has a main function. So the main function is where your program begins execution. So even if you have a function here that says function, and let's just say printf hello, it will not execute unless you call it inside main. So what happens is the execution of your program starts from main. And we are keeping it very simple though you can call other functions and do stuff without main, but we are not going to get, uh, get into those things for now. So we are assuming you do not know anything and therefore we are not doing uh, serious or complex, right? So this is what we have is can we not have a main and manually mention the start point of the code? See, this is what I was talking about. We can do many things. And yes, we uh, we can have a program where we do not have a main function and we can manually mention the start point of a code. But uh, see, the point is, if we are starting with like, what is C language and why are we programming C? Let's not quote, get into those things in the first session itself, right? <sighs> I think you understand that, right? Okay, great. So this, uh, below this header file inclusion, we have something what we call a comment. So a comment is something which is, which either starts with a double lines or double forward slashes, or this way, right? A forward slash star and it ends with forward slash star. 
so this is a c style comment which is a multi line comment basically so anything besides this anything besides these two characters or symbols is a c line c comment until unless it it encounters this thing a reverse of these two characters so anything between these is a comment and anything any statement or any data or anything whatever you type in a comment is not processed by the compiler it is ignored by the compiler so comments are used to tell information for example after this main function starts right so that is the job of uh, comment now this is the c uh, comment or basically c style comment so c usually supported basically c is supported the c line comment this is a single line comment uh, to forward slashes and this is a c++ style comment so the problem with c style comments is that you need to specify this as an as the ending sequence and in case you want to write a single line comment i mean this looks ugly in most cases right for example see this you can have this we have these things in uh, multiple things multiple multiple different source codes like single uh, single line comments but these uh, c++ style comments if we are talking about single line comments these looks much uh, cleaner and therefore uh, we usually use these comments as well if i'm not wrong these were introduced in c89 or c99 proposal so if we are talking about single line comments then we are going to use c++ style comments after that we have main function so this is the code anything between anything between these parentheses this and this is the code for this function main uh, the structure of a function uh, let's say function structure right let's discuss a function structure so this is a function and the function is a named block of code and therefore these two lines are having the name main no we cannot use those things okay so <clears throat> moving ahead function structure so a function function is a named block of code so if we if i want this uh, to be used again and again multiple times so i can put this in a function for example let's suppose void function and let's suppose void again and let's just write this thing right so this is one thing now and then i can call this function multiple times so that would make me not do this uh, not write this uh, functions code again and again now if you have not programmed before you might be thinking why does it matter i mean you can write a single line so many times right but the thing is we usually write functions which have a different functionality or discrete functionality for example let's suppose i have uh, i need to write a code which reads a file which opens a file reads the data and processes it processes the data in some way so that it filters something or it you know transforms lower case characters into upper case characters and let's suppose you have to use that for 10 files so instead of writing that code for 10 times or writing that for one uh, writing that code one time and then copy pasting it nine more times you write a single function and then you use that function so that keeps the code clean manageable and therefore if any problem comes you can easily debug that thing so this is the basic structure of a c program and this is the same thing that we will be following in all our session series right so this here was the printf function let's do right so printf function is the function that is used to print something on the screen as you can see from its name right so this is the output of printf and once that has been done we have a return zero so return zero states that uh, there was no problem in function execution and once main returns the operating system sees that main return zero everything went well and the program exits properly right 
So that is the most basic uh, architecture or I would say organization of a C program. I think that is clear, right? Okay, the question is, is it compulsory to mention return zero? Uh, I don't know what you are asking because we can mention return one or return any other value because see, the main function has a return type int. So we are not discussing the functions because right now, how to declare, define and use functions because uh, we are going to use functions or we are going to cover functions in I think second or third session. So till then, the thing is, we have said that main will return an integer. So you have to return something. And zero is usually associated with no errors. And therefore, we are returning zero, right? Okay, great. So that was this. Moving to the next topic, we have understanding the process of compilation. So the process of compilation is not a single step process, right? You do not just, you know, do this and you get the file, hello, right? What happens is there are multiple steps. So, sublime. So what happens is there's the source file, which is name.c, right? any file which has a .c extension, you pass it to GCC to compile. First thing is preprocessor, preprocessing, which will process hash, include, and anything which is like, there are multiple things, hash define, hash if define, and like we are going to cover those things in, a, in another session. But the thing is, we saw this thing, right, hash include. So this thing is going to be processed by the preprocessor. So first thing preprocessor will process these things. And then once these have been processed, then the GCC or the G, uh, yeah, then GCC will take on, GCC will do code analysis and stuff. And then we get an object file. And yeah, we do not directly get an object file, but it is the simplest. Uh, explanation that we are having for now, right? We will get into how uh, compilers work, how the compiler will analyze the code, and then it will create something, something, then it will analyze, uh, then it will uh, create optimization, it will, uh, you know, create an intermediate representation. And then after that intermediate representation, there will be some assemblers and linkers and those things, right? So we are not going to get into those things. Simply speaking, first thing that happens is preprocessing. Second thing that happens is it produces an uh, object file. So object file usually have uh, .obj in the name or .o if we are talking about Linux object files. These files uh, are just simple assembly language uh, kind of representation which do not have any calls resolved. For example, if you are calling, if you uh, we called uh, printf, right? So in the object file, the symbols are not resolved. Everything is there, but symbol resolution has not been done. So once the symbol resolution is done by the linker, this is where the linker comes in. So linker links the uh, object file with the proper library, which will provide the code for printf, scanf, and other things, any other header files that you have uh, mentioned and used. And then finally, we get the executable file, which on Linux is a ELF file. And on Windows, it is an exe file in most cases, right? So this is how the process of compilation works. And this is a very high level overview. There are multiple uh, phases. I think preprocessing is a two phase thing. Uh, the point, uh, the compiler takes about six to eight kind of different things. And then finally, we get the object file with the help of assembler. And what that has been done, linker is involved, and then the object file is then turned into an executable file. So this was a very high level overview to give you an idea that there are multiple things involved, right? So the question is where code goes first, a stack or heap? 
okay look uh, stack is a different thing and heap is a different thing both stack and heap are used to hold uh, data text or code is a code segment or code section whatever you want to say and therefore it has a different uh, place so this is what it looks like usually so we have text actually yeah let's just have it stack and then so there are various mappings it can be stack it can be any of those things right then here's the heap so stack grows downwards and heap grows upwards then uh, we have bss we have data we have text so this is where your code resides this is where uh, global data resides this is uh, where global uninitialized data resides this is where you get malloc calloc reloc and basically any other dynamic memory allocation part this is where your local variables for example int x int y and whatever if they are inside a function scope right so this is how it all works so the stack is defined allocated according to the code like the space for variables heap is for dynamic allocation yes uh, heap is used when you use functions such as malloc calloc reloc specifically uh, stack is used by default for example to hold local variables to hold return addresses and to hold uh, to hold to hold various uh, other kind of things right so mostly it holds just these two things another thing is anything which is related to execution of the function is also uh, stored on the stack and therefore the stack holds various things to see the real time memory uh, organization in linux we can have this thing so the proc file system cd proc so proc file system holds the data about execution and each folder as you can see is mapped to a pid or process id for example pid1 this is the pid1 i don't think we can go into one okay we can go into one and no we cannot read things because permission denied so instead of doing all that part let's try to read proc self maps so once we see what the output is uh, we will be looking at uh, i will be explaining how it works right so we see some output and let's first explain what we did here so i did a cat on this file proc self maps so self is anonymous uh, sorry is uh, the same as which process invoked it and since we use the cat program so we are going into the process id of this process which was created as the result of this command right so and inside this we have a file by the name maps so what this maps file does is it holds program mappings or segment mappings at the runtime now as you can see we have uh, these are the memory addresses this is this is the start address this is the end address uh, this is the permissions this is i think size or something i don't remember what this is and this is the name of the binary section or something which is mapped right so you can see this cat so since we invoke the cat program we have five uh, mappings and each mapping is of a particular size so it starts with this ends on this it starts with this and said this thing so but the thing is there is only one executable copy of bin cat in memory which is this one because it has the x or the executable permission the rest of the copies have read permission and this copy has a read write permission so this must be for some data which can be for some section which can be readable and writable in memory and you can see this is the heap 
mapping. So the heat is mapped from this to this. Then we have some local archive mapping. Then we have libc mapping for the code of C library. Then we have some anonymous mappings, which no idea what is since there is no information available. Then we have some runtime linker mappings or interpreter mappings. Then we have another anonymous mapping. And this is where it gets interesting. This is the stack. So you notice the address of the stack is, let me just copy it. Uh, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, so the stack is mapped, unfortunately. So this is the stack address and the heap is this address. And the reason being stack starts from the top and it goes to the bottom, whereas the heap is somewhere in the middle. And if you talk about the text section, which is here, right, so this is the text section, or this is where the code is mapped from this address to this address. So code is at the lowest, I think. Yes, so code is at the lowest in this scenario because this section only has read permissions. So it might be some other section of the binary itself. So this binary is mapped as five different sections, but really no idea why, uh, where a particular section is in this. Uh, the data section will have, of course, readable and writable permissions and uh, the BSS section will also have readable and writable permissions. So these are these two things, most probably. We have three sections which have only readable permissions and therefore those might be some other sections or some other informations which was mapped along with the binary. Now <clears throat> for our practical purposes this is the lowest in memory. This is data and BSS which has read write permissions. Yeah right because some global information might be readable and writable. So there's that. Then after that, we have heap and on the top, we have the stack. This is the basic uh, organization of the <coughs> memory in memory representation of a executable, right? So I think you understand the point. Okay, great. So moving ahead, compilation versus interpretation. So we have all been exposed to Python or Ruby or PHP, which are basically interpreted languages. And the C, C++ are examples of compiled languages. So there are multiple kinds of languages. If we talk about basically we have compiled, we have interpreted, and then on the top we have assembly, which is basically you assemble it then you link it and then you get the exe right compile is compile and get the exe interpreter is you get nothing because you have a file for example name.py right so when you run the name.py as python name.py you do not get any file which you can run I mean, you can compile it and you can get a Python compiled file or something else, but that is not the point, right? So <clears throat> the interpretation, what interpretation interpreted languages do is they have an interpreter or the interpreter does is uh, interpreter takes every single line, execute it inside the memory and moves ahead. And let's suppose there was an error in this line in interpretation. So this all will work fine. There will be an error on this line. And once you fix the error on this line, then it will move next. In case of compiled languages, what happens is the compiler reads the whole file at once, right? So it will read the whole file. It will report whether there are whether there are no errors or whether there is one error or whether there are uh, two errors, 10 errors or something like that, right? 
once you have done all that the compiler will finally get you an exe so what is the actual difference i mean uh, the difference in terms of execution speed is what we are talking about so who returns errors interpret itself yes uh, in case of an interpreted language the interpreter will return the error and tell you that there has been an error right for example let's see this as equal to hello and since uh, python is not uh, python and strings are immutable let's just do this this error has been returned by python interpreter right so let's exit this so the advantage of compiled languages over interpreted languages is that you get an exe and then you do not need the compiler again right you can pass the exe or the executable on the same platform for example if it is in linux executable you can pass that executable to anyone who has the linux and it will run without any problem as well as it will be fast because you do not need to process things one line at a time right you have already turned it into a machine executable file or the file which has uh, executable data machine instructions and therefore compiled uh, objects or the exes are usually much faster in execution in terms of interpreted languages right or interpreted scripts so that is the basic difference that uh, we have to take care of right now understanding the c philosophy so this is the one of the most th most uh, important things that you have to keep in mind during the whole sessions let's just have this so the c philosophy states that uh, keep things simple right so c, c is a very small language to be honest right so there are tons and tons of things in python c plus plus and other languages but c is actually a very small language so keep things as simple as possible second thing is uh, you are responsible for what you want to do for what you want to do for example you want to shoot yourself right for some reason you are so stupid that you want to shoot yourself so c will not complain c is like go ahead do it right so c uh, c will give you the gun and you can go shoot yourself that is the point of c and this changes the burden right so what this does is now you are responsible you must know what you're doing and this is where most people have problems with right so most people do not understand how pointers work most people do not understand a majority of things right and then they like c is hard or like this should not be possible or whatever this is like if you do not know what you're doing then c is probably not for you you should be doing some other languages for example python or something else for example you have a pointer right and your pointer is null let's suppose you want to do is uh no there are like hundreds of methods to shoot yourself without even using pointers but at the end of the day pointers is one of the easiest right so let's suppose you set a pointer to null and then int x and then you want a value from pointer but you do not know it is null because you were lazy enough to not check the value of pointer and you just read the value from that pointer from that location into x so what do you think will happen now one school of thought says that you should not be able to do this because there would be some error and you should not be able to dereference the null pointer but what c is like uh, you must know what you're doing if you do not know what you're doing then at the end of the day it is your fault right so yeah for example one of the most common things is that people confuse with is array indexing or the problems with array indexing for example you have an array of 10 objects called yeah so you have an array of 10 objects but what you want to do is for some reason you access 12th 15th area, 15th element now the thing is well, it is your problem you are accessing 15th element the way how c handles arrays or the way how arrays are represented and used inside 
C programming language or through C programming language, it is perfectly valid, right? So this statement is valid. It is actually as valid as this statement is, right? These two statements are exactly the same thing, right? So this is where most probably most people have complaints with because Java say Java will say it is an out of bound array access uh, exception or area out of bound exception, which is the technical name. Python or some other languages where, right, the point is in most example, in most languages where you have some safe mechanism, they throw an error. But the point is C says, uh, I trust you what you're doing. So if you are accessing array 15 or 15th or 16th element of the array, then maybe that's what you want. So go ahead and do it. And this is what makes it so simple, right? So it is just super plain. It is as plain as something can be. And this is the best part of C, right? And it takes a lot of time and I would say effort and understanding to see why this is the best part. Now we will see why this is later, but these are the basic fundamentals of the C philosophy, which are not really seen in other languages. For example, talking about the pointers, right? A pointer is something which points to a location, which points to an address, basically, right? Or which is an address which points to a variable or identifier or value, whatever. Now, if you are carelessly pointing at somewhere else, or if you are using a pointer which you should not use, or if you are using a pointer which has already been freed, then well, that is your problem, right? So this is why most people hate C, but I mean, at the end of the day, it again boils down to simple preferences. Some people like it, some people do not like it. Right, so this is what I want you to understand. So we will be having multiple things, for example, how array accesses values, how strings process values, uh, how pointers work, how you can pass pointers to different things. And in, if you mess something up, if you do something wrong, then yes, things will break and you will definitely be complaining. So this was in advance to tell you that there are going to be things which are, which are going to be problematic, right? Where we define pointer inside or outside main function, we can define pointer anywhere. And that's the whole point. C says you can, well, if you want to do something, I will help it, right? So you can define pointer inside a function, you can define pointer outside a function. Anyways, let's start with actual programming, data types, variables, and expressions. So the first question is what are data types? So a data type is uh, something that is used to represent a chunk in memory. This is one of the most simple, uh, this is the simplest definition that I would say would be. Right, so a data, a data type is loosely uh, used a, a term to tell you what operations are available on something and how much memory is it going to use. For example, let's again start with this thing. So, data types. So a data type tells two things basically. One is a size of memory per element. And another is uh, <coughs> operations which are valid or which are permitted on that data type. For example, integer is, uh, as you can understand, is a number, right? So integer is a number. And therefore, the size is, again, size. We are going to talk about sizes. Uh, size is usually four bytes. And operations are, what are the operations that uh, should be allowed on integers? Well, plus, minus, multiply, divide, and we have another thing which is the module operator. So this is modulo or the uh, remainder operator. It tells you if you divide something by something, how much remainder would you get? For example, if you divide 10 by three, you would get one as the remainder, right? Because three into three is nine and you get one. 
So these are the basic operations that should be allowed on integers. However, let's suppose uh, you have something else. For example, you have a pointer. Now pointer is a data type, perhaps, right? Pointer, the size is size of an address because it holds an address and therefore it must have enough uh, room to hold address. And what are the operations that you can have on a pointer, right? So it does not make any sense to add two addresses because a pointer is essentially an address. You cannot multiply two addresses, right? New Delhi into Mumbai does not yield anything, right? You cannot divide two addresses, so that is again stupid. Of course, there's no need for the modulo. Uh, but what you can do is you can subtract some addresses, right? Subtraction. But why is subtraction allowed? Because to see the difference between the two distances. Int size is two or four, right? So the thing is uh, integer size or the sizes are usually defined by the compiler used, so, but a standard is the NC there is there are very less standards right so what you can do is uh, we have something by the name size of so printf size of int is let's just percent z d right bytes and we can see the size of a data type by using size of and i mean if you want to see the size of int you can use you can do this so what this will return is it will return a number which will tell you how many bytes are going to be utilized by that data type right so let's see uh, integer character right so integer is one thing and we have a short int, we have a long int. These are the integer to represent something to uh, that we can use uh, floating point numbers or. Okay, so see the thing is the session is going live, session is streamed live on YouTube. So you can check anytime whenever you are comfortable with it. So, uh, integers to process integers we have three things at the very least so there's an integer there's a short int which is uh, usually two bytes right then we have a long int which is usually eight bytes on 64 bit machines or four bytes on 32 bit machines now to deal with numbers that contains decimal uh, point uh, which are like for example 4.2 or 6.56.8 right so to represent these numbers or to use these numbers we have float float and double which is basically a double float so float is of four bytes double is of uh, eight bytes and we have something long double which is of 10 bytes or 16 bytes we need to check that thing right youtube link is uh, it was passed in the email i think or you um can... i will be sharing it uh, uh, after a session okay sure we will share it after the session okay so these three things are for uh, real numbers uh, these three things are for integers right or whole numbers whatever you um, no, yeah we can do big ones and besides that we also have something which is care or a single character right to represent a single character which is a single byte now to tell you the uh, answer of size differences so sizes are defined by the compiler uh, another thing is well sizes are not really fixed to be honest by the standards for example, a character is a single byte, which is n psi standard size, right? So ANSI standard, ANSI size of care, which initially used, which initially used seven bits because, well, it was English only. Then they moved to eight bits. 
so this is the n size size of a character a short is now see the definitions are kind of like this an integer is about four bytes or something a short is less than or shorter than an int but at max it can be the size of an int long is at the very least as long as int but uh, it can be bigger so the definitions are kind of weird in this thing so to see what the sizes of uh, object or uh, data types are so we are going to do this thing uh, int then let's just have a short here right short then we have an int uh, we have flop we have uh, double okay i forgot long we have long and then yeah we have long long as well but you get the point right so double and let's just say long double right so care short int long plot double long double right so this is what we're going to see this is a minus o oh, hello and yeah so character is one byte short is two bytes int is four long is eight float is four double is eight and long double is 16 bytes in size and these are the results on my 64 bit linux system uh, on 32 bits long will be four bytes in size and this would be i'm not really sure on 32 bit system let's see what will this what will be the size on a 32 bit system okay so by using the minus m32 uh, parameter to gcc on a 64 bit machine we compile the code as a 32 bit code right so you can see in 32 bit code we have integer and long both four bytes but on 64 bit code integer and longs are eight bytes so the sizes are not fixed in stone right there are no standards which says like uh, an integer must be four bytes and the long must be eight bytes we do not care about the machine 32 bits or 64 bits in size right so it really depends on the compiler and the specifications i think you get the point by now okay so the question is which primitive and non-primitive data types are supported in c okay so we have two types of data types uh, that is a good question i forgot to tell you about primitive and not primitive data types primitive data types and non primitive data types so a primitive data type is basically what we have seen right now right so this is a basic data type a primitive data type is uh, the fundamental type of data type a non primitive data type is something which is a collection or an aggregation of the primitive data types for example a class if you have heard about uh, object oriented programming a class is a example of non primitive data type or in c what is structure is a non a non primitive data type union a string though there is nothing by the name string in c we have a character array an array is again a non primitive data type so a non primitive data type is something which is not provided by default but can be created by you i think the answer is clear right okay great so what is the point of using data types uh, we learned what data types are but what is the need for data types right why do we need like three different types to represent a single number right or three different types to represent a decimal number and the answer is there are various things okay could we say non primitive are derived from primitive yes non primitive data types are derived from primitive data types and that is why they are also known as derived prim derived data types i think i might be wrong but 
as far as my understanding goes that is the thing so <clears throat> now the question comes why do we need three different data types or three different sizes to support a single uh, number which is a whole number or an integer and the answer is it depends on the situation right let's suppose uh, you have size constraints or you have you have either size constraints on the program memory or you have size constraints on your input for example let's suppose uh, you are taking age as input right so your input is age so it does not really make sense to have a for an integer by default right you can have an integer as a most cases people do but think about it you do not really need the thing age can be uh, between 0 to let's say, let's say 0 to uh, 100 let's say 120 right so this can be the bracket or let's say 150 i don't really think anybody lives more than that so you can represent age as the character only right so what that will do is if you represent the age as a character and let's have uh, a difference as an int right so difference would be it takes four bytes and it takes one byte and therefore uh, the limits come in right so a character will be between uh, 0 to 255 if we are talking about uh, unsigned which is basically negative positive right so 0 to 255 I think yeah okay. I'm getting too mathematical here in terms of symbol but yeah but whereas in terms of this would be between uh, 0 to 2 raised to power 32 yeah minus 1 so you do not really want to have this much size for your input of age when the input of age fits perfectly between this thing so you save three bytes and operations will get restricted only on one byte for some operations one byte is more than enough for some operations you need four bytes for some operations you need eight bytes and for some operations you need more than eight bytes and therefore we have different uh, data types to solve those things. For example, a float is basically uh, precision up to uh, six, uh, six place after digit, after decimal, sorry, after dot. But if you need more than six uh, places uh, precision, so you use float, which gets you up to 14 or 16, if I'm not wrong, 14 would be the point. I think I'm not really sure but the point is if you need more precision than six places after the dot use double and if you need more precision and you use and you need higher values then you can use long double right more precision and this is uh, the difference where uh, the difference between different data types that hold the same data right I think we understand that thing right Okay, so let's move ahead. So type modifiers. So we learned about what data types are. Let's talk about type modifiers. So a type modifier is something that modifies uh, type modifier is something that modifies the behavior of that modifies uh, behavior of data type. Right. For example, by default, each of these data types has uh, negative and positive values, positive uh, representation. For example, uh, integer or let's suppose character. A character holds values between uh, minus 128 to 127. Uh, short would be uh, sorry 
माइनस ऑफ टू रेज टू पावर फिफ्टीन टू टू रेज टू पावर फिफ्टीन माइनस वन सो द पॉइंट इज इफ यू डो नॉट राइट एनी थिंग और इफ यू जस्ट यूज एन इंटीजर और अ कैरेक्टर एज इट इज दे कैन स्टोर निगेटिव और पॉजिटिव वैल्यूज बट इफ यू ओनली वॉन्ट लेट सपोज यू ओनली वॉन्ट पॉजिटिव वैल्यूज फॉर एग्जाम्पल टॉकिंग अबाउट द एज अगेन राइट द एज कैन नॉट बी निगेटिव फॉर अ पर्सन बट हाउ डू यू रेस्ट्रिक्ट और हाउ डू यू टेल योर प्रोग्राम दैट डो नॉट टेक अ नेगेटिव नंबर और डो नॉट पोस्ट अ नेगेटिव नंबर राइट फॉर दैट थिंग वट वी हैव इज अ टाइप मोडिफायर विच कैटेगराइजेज थिंग्स एज अनसाइंड एंड साइंड सो साइंड नंबर्स आर नेगेटिव and positive by default right so a sign number is something which can be negative or positive whereas an unsigned number is something which can only be positive so to let's suppose you want to you know take age as an input so you will use unsigned char and then age so what this will ensure is this ensures that uh, age will never be zero never be zero and it can never be more than it can never be more than 255 so this is what it ensures and this is this is uh, why we use type modifiers for example you only need positive numbers so you just tell you just write unsigned before the data type and then it does not contain negative values right hope that is clear okay so moving ahead need for variables or what are variables so a variable is something which uh, is used to hold a value for example a variable is something that can change basically and it holds a value for example int age is a variable where you can store an age uh, where you can store the age of a person right let's suppose initial value is 15 then you incremented because there was a birthday and then it gets 16 so this is what a variable is used for it is a named uh, location for an input which can be used in most basic sense yes so let's see uh, this all as a as an example right so sublime Board of C. Regex is supported or not? Yes, Regex is supported, but uh, you have different header files for those things. So you need to include the proper header file. So let's write a program which just uh, takes someone's age as the input, and then it checks whether they are eligible to vote or not. So. let's just say int age printf enter your age so printf function is used to print something on screen as we have seen right and to take input we are using scanf there are multiple functions that can be used to take input but scanf is most uh, common and it works perfectly fine so until unless we need something which scanf cannot provide we are going to use scanf right so scanf uh, works pretty much like printf so to take this input as an integer we are going to represent use percent d and we are going to pass the address of a variable where we want to take the input so age and what this does is this provides the address of this thing so age when we write age we mean the value inside this variable and when we prepend it with an ampersand we mean the address of this variable right so printf 
okay you are person d eight years old and that is the basic idea so we're just taking the input and printing it back in gcc what dot c minus o what what 15 see i have 15 years old now to demonstrate the point that we were talking about the sizes as well as uh, uh, the type modifiers let's see what happens and this is where the point of uh, proper programming comes in right so let's say my my age is minus 20 now i'm minus 20 years old see this should not be possible because nobody can be minus 20 years old and this is one thing and another thing is let's suppose i am two five six this years old i'm not supposed to be this this many years old right and that is the point so to enforce these things we have to to see this right unsigned care and to do this we have Okay, I think this is the point. Yeah. Minus 10, I'm 246 years old. And I'm zero years old. And let's suppose, and see, I'm not this many years old. Now this is the phenomenon or this is the thing why minus 10 got converted into 246 is because well it's something called things i mean how do i explain this thing okay so i would give this as a homework to figure out why minus 10 when passed to an unsigned value of a character gives you 246 and not something else right so that would be one homework now <clears throat> this was the basic uh, fundamental idea of taking input and printing something on screen as well as using variables are those sky values are output uh, sky values which values are you asking about everything is sky here since okay so Okay, so this is uh, all sky, right? So this is all sky. Now, one question: minus ten is for minus ten is two forty six. Uh, okay, so minus ten is also an sky value, and two forty six is also an sky value. So you have to see by yourself why that is being turned into two forty six. In the next session, in the next session, we are going to cover that. And in case you have the doubt in case you figure out we can take that uh, before the session right so this is consider this as your homework now one question i have been taught c in my college but most students including me think c is outdated but when i see projects on coding go and other people in this okay how can i improve my programming skills and make it more interesting because most of the time we are writing code now. <sighs> okay so see the thing is c is not outdated uh, majority majority of things are still coded in C or C++, right? Uh, no, some people might differ, but mostly C or C++ is pretty much the same thing, right? And when I'm saying C or C++, C or C++ is the same, pretty much the same thing. The reason is they are pretty much uh, at the same level of complexity or uh, in the hierarchy of programming languages, right? They are both high level programming languages they are not very high level programming languages and they are not uh, middle level or low level programming languages so those two languages are pretty much the same thing uh, those two languages target the pretty much the same uh, base of softwares for example native softwares are usually programmed in c or c plus plus web browsers c or c plus plus mostly c plus plus because c plus plus is uh, for very big tasks c plus plus is uh, pretty easier to code with c becomes at times c becomes a bit uh, i would say hard to manage because c++ provides a lot of libraries and stuff 
right so c++ has a little bit advantage over there now <clears throat> okay now another thing is hmm so uh, so c is not outdated operating systems are still written in c linux is written in c uh, windows is written in c drivers are still written in c right you create a new driver for linux or you create a new driver for your windows 10 system you are going to write in c or c++ the thing is it is not outdated games are programmed in c or c++ game engines are programmed in c or c++ the majority of code is still in c or c++ things are getting programmed in c or c++ it's just people have a really different mindset for example in colleges they propagate the thing that java is the best and everybody requires java when the thing is the professors who uh, claim that java is very good they do not seem to be able to explain why java is that good because java sucks to be honest right java is very bad now <clears throat> uh, majority of professors have not done any job in terms of actual professional sector right they have not been parts of projects they have not developed programs they have not worked on other things they have just did their b tech did their m tech and then they are uh, teaching for last 20 years and then they are like nobody uses c no th that is not the point right as for uh, any suggestions for beginner project see any project can be a beginner or intermediate project think of something and just try to write it in c or c++ right that should get you started we can do other things as well right so once we progress in this series you will get many ideas and if you want to you know wait till then that would be much better okay so the question is how are negative integers stored okay let's have this as another homework and in the next session we will be talking about how a negative integer is stored or a positive integer is stored right now okay so we still have some time i think we will need another half an hour at least yeah we will need another half an hour to do this thing and in the next in the in this half an hour we will finish this thing now uh name variables right so we need a name for a variable because let's suppose you want to store 10 things as a program you let's suppose you want to store the data of student so for, for the student a uh, name age gender roll number uh current year section and let's suppose aggregate right at this uh, aggregate marks till this point so you have a lot of things so you need this many at least this many named locations so you don't mix up with so first thing is you need to store these things second thing is you need to access those things for example let's suppose you need to print the name of a student until unless you have something which directly points to the name of the student in your input you cannot do that thing and therefore you need to properly name your variables and use those variables properly, right now variables are called identifiers in c right so identifier is the proper word which basically identifies something in most cases it is an input for example the name the name identifier you can write it as name uh, in the program we saw age right so this is an identifier now the rules are pretty simple you cannot have something which is having a single or a double uh, underscore because usually those kind of usually that style is uh, re restricted or not allowed you allowed for you to use because a lot of internal C library functions or global variables use that kind of style, right? So it is better to not use a single uh, underscore or double underscore and keep it simple. Another rule is 
uh, keep your identifier names or variable names as just as descriptive as you can because uh, let's suppose this is a big program so even if how big the program is i see a variable name age what do i uh, expect it which should contain age or something like that right but let's suppose we have a b c d e right let's suppose we have five different variable names and the function is let's suppose 100 lines long now what would i understand like what does the variable a means or what does the variable b means right it does not mean anything and this would really complicate things if you are even trying to understand your own code let's suppose two months from now or three days from now when you are getting into an error and you're like i don't know what c is and then you are really scrolling up and down again and again to make sense of it what c means and what d means and why you did not write those names properly right so it is uh, always uh, uh, suggested that you use proper names for example gender you can be like gender roll number is uh, roll number uh, year can be year section is section so the point is even if someone else takes a look and sorry the spelling is gender is wrong yeah so even if someone else takes a look at okay the variable name is gender so of course they will get to know what the variable means and even if you are debugging something is crashing you will know what a certain variable holds so if a certain variable holds a different thing when it is not supposed to hold that value you will see what the problem is right so this helps in debugging it helps in writing clean code it helps in maintaining code let's suppose uh, you were working for a company and then you leave the company the code is passed to someone else so the person can also understand and modify it properly uh, or you create a project and then you open source it so people who are using it who want to understand it can under understand it properly so variable names should be properly uh, used or written right chosen now we have covered all the kind of basics theory and this was a little too much it took us more than 90 minutes to cover this much theory now let's move to programming so till this point we have seen uh, basic input out basic input and output the reason being to take output is usually by printf input as we are using scanf right so this is what we're going to do now coming back to the question right we have vote.c so let's suppose the task is to uh, check the validity of water if less than 18 decline else uh, he is allowed to vote right so basic idea now this kind of thing or this kind of functionality requires you to make a decision this kind of functionality requires you to uh, have the ability to code or uh, not the code the to make decisions to compare things for example you need to compare the age with whether it is less than 18 or it is more than 18 right and for that we have multiple options first and the simple most is the if statement and if a statement uh, works as expected if if something is true right so if something is true if age is greater than 18 uh, we will print you can vote right so this is uh, simplest thing which is what and let's suppose my age is 21 okay sorry my age is 21 yeah so i can vote i'm 21 years old and i can vote let's suppose my age is 10 i'm not allowed to vote now in this example we saw that if uh, we pass a criteria we can do something but we did not see what if let's suppose you want to print or you want to take an action if this statement is not true right 
so that is where the else part comes in if else so printf you cannot vote check again i can vote and if i'm if my age is less than 18 i cannot vote the most simple and the most fundamental method of decision making is if else now what you can do is uh, you can also make multiple decisions for example uh, you can have uh, various blocks of else if uh, okay. so let's suppose you want to say age is uh greater than 65 right so print f you are senior citizen right so what happens is we are comparing multiple things so first thing we are checking whether the age is greater than 18 if the age is greater than 18 the person is allowed to vote then we are checking if the age is greater than 65 then the person is also a senior citizen right so we can have different functionality based on that thing and if neither of those things is there then the person cannot vote right so compile it again vote 21 yes i can vote and that's 66 you are 66 years old and you can vote Okay, this is problematic. It should not be there. Hmm, I don't think this should be there. It should be like you are 66. I can vote, yes. But I should also be able to print this thing. Okay, so in case uh, something does not work properly, another method can be is, uh, you know, I, I do not really want to extend the session too much because we originally planned it for 90 minutes and it has already been about, it is about uh, two hours, right? So instead of this, instead of else if, we can have nested if else so if we can also have if inside this if age is greater than 65 print if you are senior let's just see if it works okay great so what happens is uh, we can so this this thing is called as nested if or nested if else so I can also present an else here which would be uh, print f uh, you are not senior right so because your age is not greater than 65 but your age is greater than 18 so you can vote but you are not a senior right so let's suppose 55 now you can vote but you are not a senior so this thing is what we call a nested if else where you have an if else or if inside another if else so this is the nested if else approach to do things of course you can you could have done that with a single if else or even an else if i don't know what the, why that is not working for now but we will see later right so this is one thing another uh, method of making decisions is a switch case statement so a switch case statement is much like an if else statement but what happens is uh, in case of switch case statement you need to be very precise right you cannot compare things but you can make cases for example sublime switch.c So int age, let's just say K 
care wall, right? So let's just see if the user enters a character. Enter a character. Scanf would be percent %c to take a character as an input and pass the address of the input variable. Now, so we will see if it is or the input is uh, something which exactly matches or not. So in case of switch case, we have switched on the input which we are talking and we are going to do a case. So a printf vowel, right, break. So we have five holes and a e I O U default is a case which does not uh, match with any case and here we will print it is not a mobile. and after the default or any of these break it will jump out the switch and let's just print switch ended switch ended enter a character let's suppose q is not a wall and switch ended okay so i need to print a new line here so that it gets different yeah so q is not a wall right but let's see what happens if i i i is a wall and switch ended now the difference between if else and switch is the first thing is well why do we need switch right so we could have achieved the same thing or the same comparisons with if but we would have to do if a vowel equals to a then this if vowel equals to e then this so we would have to write five different if and then they would have been an else so we would have to you know do so much in case of vowel since it was direct uh, equality comparison so we just uh, uh, we did not need to write that much lines of code this is uh, the switch case and the problem with switch case is you cannot check for example you cannot check whether uh, wall or some number is greater than or less than something you cannot perform comparison operations so what case a equals is uh, this would directly translate into if not directly but kind of equally right so if wall equals to a if wall equals to a then print that's a state wall, right? So this is what it is. So you can assume this statement is pretty much this statement. Okay, can we use array for single case and make the code little more or less like in a single case? I did not understand what you mean by array for a single case and make the code little more or less. Uh, no idea what you are asking seriously. maybe uh, if uh, you want to you know if you can write using an array and print uh, you know message it as a group chat message we can see because uh, i have no idea what you are saying so till then uh, till okay case a i o u no this is not how it works uh, this is the only this is the only syntax of using switch case i mean you switch on something and then you specify a case one by one so 
this is the actual syntax and this is how you have to use it i think that is clear right okay great now conditional operator so conditional operator is a kind of a hack i would say a conditional operator is more like I need to see how the how the conditional operator works. All right, let's just have the conditional operator right here, and int value. All right, so let's just have printf enter a number. All right, scanf take integer as an input we use percent b and then we take the address and go right so this okay sorry unfortunately i wrote the wrong one well right so we are taking the input as the value now in this we are moving to so what we can do is we can either compare using if else or uh, we can use switch case if we are trying to do the equality operations or equality comparisons. Now there's another thing that is uh, true uh, that, that can be used for comparisons, right? So that is the ternary operator. So ternary operator. Now what that, how that works is, uh, let's suppose we want to check if value is greater than 10. So that is the condition and yeah so that is the condition so this signifies the start uh, of the this is the comparison part now the first part is uh, this is uh, true and this is false so this is uh, where we write what happens if the point is true so we are going to write printf um, I don't think it would work that way. Yeah, true, right. Uh, in case of false, let's write printf false. And let's see if this works or not. Because I'm not really sure because I, I do not really use this uh, syntax. Switch a, enter a number, let's say 10. And yes, it works fine. So, okay. So here we are. Hmm. Now what happens is if the value is greater than 10, it will print true. Let's just pass this test and let's suppose the input is 12 and it says true. So we could have written this uh, single statement as let's just have a multi comment to show you what we could have written it and we could have done it if uh, value is greater than 10 uh, print f uh, true right uh, then else print f it would have been false so we uh, this I uh, would say five line code has been reduced to a single line code and this is the ternary operator the name is ternary because it takes three parameters or three different things this is the condition which is tested whether it is true or false if it is true then this part of code will be executed if the result of this statement is false then this part will get executed which if you want to write it in as uh, if else this would be represented like this and since it is a comparison operation you cannot write it as a switch case statement right i hope this is clear right so these were the <clears throat> these were the few different things that are used in decision making in c so which gives you or which provides you the uh, power to 
test whether something is true or false and through which you can test whether something has been successful something has not been successful and things like that so we have covered uh, decision making in c the last thing that is required for today is looping in c right and the question is what are loops and why do we require loops so we have covered a fundamental question we have covered various fundamental questions the first thing is how to take input output second thing is how to make decisions right um, whether some, what, what to do if something is true or what to do when something is false right uh, now once that has been done uh, we move to the fun functionality where uh, we want something when we want to you know we want to execute something multiple times for example where you want to run a run something 100 times run a code 100 times or a thousand times or unless user enters a specific input right till then just keep asking the same questions right unless the user says quit just keep asking the same questions so this thing is the repetition again and again is what we call a loop so a loop is for example a b c and after then c you want to again move to a then b then c then again a then b then c basically until unless you want to exit and since we already decided how to make we already uh, learned how to make decisions well you can always decide like when to exit out of the loop now the use of loops is again we just talked about right we sometimes we do want to require the facility for example let's suppose a better example would be let's suppose you have a record of 100 students and you want to um, you know take the name and write it to a different file for some purpose right so you need to write a loop you need to write a loop that will run a hundred times you need to write a loop that will run a hundred times so that this task can be done so the question comes is how to write a loop right how to write a loop and to write a loop we have uh, certain things for example we have a for loop we have a while loop and a do while loop so let's start with <coughs> a for loop right so let's just have a loop in okay so should we continue it today or should we uh, cover the loops tomorrow because i don't think uh, people are paying much attention and i think it has been really uh, tiring experience it's already been two hours right so what do you want should we cover it right now or should we cover it tomorrow i mean in the next session cover it now okay okay so let's just cover it now let's finish it so let's suppose uh hmm. Okay, great. So there are two people who are saying to today. <sighs> Loop dot C. Inch number. So let's define the objective. So take a number oh i hit this keyboard take a number as input and print all the numbers from one to that number right and the second would be 
another objective uh, add all the numbers from one to that number which if you know a little maths from class i would say 10th or 8th sum of n numbers from 1 to n is n n minus 1 divided by 2 right so first thing is we are going to do this thing and once we accomplish this thing we are going to do this thing right so we are going to take a variable as a number and print it enter a number scan f uh, person d number now at this point we have taken the number as an input so we are going to use for loop so this is the uh, structure of the for loop syntax of the for loop to be honest right so for loop starts with for loop has three things and let's just expand those things uh, for initialization uh, condition or comparison let's say comparison which is basically the exit statement to be honest i don't really remember what is the case and this is the update statement so initialization is uh, the initialization initialization of the counter and in this case the counter is i uh, the counter is something that will count how far we have reached the number right because we need a number which will tell whether we are at one two three four five have uh, we counted till the number that has been input or uh, have we you know go on ahead because we need something to tell us whether we have reached the number how many we need to print or not right the basic idea so this is the initial initialization we start with zero and we are going to count till number minus one but since we have to cover from one to that number so we are just going to do uh, one and less than or equal to sorry, less than or equal to number and plus plus i so update statement is to update the counter so at every single loop uh, iteration for example let's suppose we have three statements here so in after these three statements when the loop moves again it checks whether it has been true or not i mean after this what happens is the update statement executes and then the condition is checked so uh, we need to update it again right so this mechanism the update statement uh, ensures that uh, the number updates by itself and we do not have to increment it again and again okay yes i can speak about post increment and pre increment oh, okay so these things is getting seriously complex uh, just a second let me just keep it open here so there are two things one thing is post increment I mean, let's just not do this here. Here, so one thing is post increment, and one is pre increment, right? So post increment, so increment is uh, like something plus one is basically increment, right? Now this is increment. So what do we mean by what do we mean by post increment? So post increment is. Uh, the operator plus plus is used so let's suppose count plus plus is the post increment and plus plus count is pre increment at the end of the day both means uh, count plus one which is of course going to be updated inside count so count equals to count plus one and here again count equals to count plus one the difference between post and pre increment is let's suppose seven plus uh, yeah let's suppose uh, count is five for example right so let's suppose we are doing seven plus count plus plus yes so this is the post increment so what this will expand to is it will get seven plus five which will result in 12 but sorry 12 yeah but what happens is 
since there has been a plus plus so in case of post increment the value of count will be used and then this count equals to count plus one will get executed so at the end of this statement what happens is uh, the result is 12 but uh, count is equal to six at this point in case of pre-increment uh, it would be uh, let's rewrite the statement again seven plus oh, sorry yeah. seven plus 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 count so what happens is in this case uh, count would be count plus one and then it will be added to seven right so this is one thing now and now the result would be 13 because seven plus six is 30 and of course at the end of both statements count is six so this is uh, this is the difference between post increment and pre increment i think that is clear right uh great coming back to the loops uh, it does not matter whether you are using pre increment or post increment because the value is not getting used anywhere it is just used for checking and this check will be done once this statement has been executed so whether you do post increment or you do pre increment it does not matter right so let's just print the statement uh, percent %d and let's just print i right so this would do gcc loop dot c minus all loop dot less loop and i want to print numbers till 10 and this is the loop right so i could have either you know if i would, did not want to use a loop i would have to do the print again and again and since I did not know how many, what will be the input by the user, uh, I wrote a loop and I had to use, I had to write only one statement. And since the statement is the same because I will be substituted at runtime, right? And once I reaches 10, it will check whether, I mean, after every loop statement, it checks whether uh, the value is there or not. And to be honest, it checks before, for example, I is one, then it will check whether i is less than or equal to number which is 10 in this case if it is less then it will do the loop then it will up update it then it will check then do the loop update check update loop. right so this is how it works now to do this when the while loop uh, while loop is the same thing while loop also performs the same task right it also does the uh, looping thing so uh we also need a counter and i uh, let's just say counter equals to zero because yeah one so while counter is less than or equals to number printf uh person t new line counter trick and once that has been done counter plus plus increment the counter by one so that we can check or else it will get stuck inside an infinite loop well see this is the first loop one to twelve and this is the while loop one to twelve again now the difference between the for loop and the while loop is pretty much nothing if you talk about the uh, functionality of the loops the difference is the syntax right in the for loop you have all the three things at one location initialization comparison and update statement in while loop you have to explicitly tell okay that this is the initialization condition this is the comparison and this is the update statement now there's an advantage of for loop and that is uh, you can since it is kind of in the syntax so you do not forget that there is an update statement uh, since the while loop just has a comparison statement as a syntax requirement sometimes people forget the update statement and they get stuck in infinite loops because if you do not update the counter let's see what happens if you do not update the counter right see 
it is just printing one and why because uh, the counter is always one and since it is always less than 10 it will just keep printing one let's see a cpu resources right my cpu is at 44 percent see see this this was the spike and my memory is my memory has also been spiked so it was this and then now it is this much okay we have cpu load 42 percent see this is the problem now let's just uh, cancel it we uh, terminated the program and you see from 40 something percent 44 42 it has come down to this much and this is uh, the 22 percent 20 percent is mostly because of zoom because zoom takes so much cpu else it would have been either one percent or zero percent because we are not really doing anything right so this is the basic fundamental difference between the while loop and for loop in case of do while loop the difference is uh, do while loop is the syntax is this this is the condition part and since the condition is checked at the exit part right the condition is checked while the while we are exiting from the loop so do i loop exits uh, executes at least once okay thank you so i'm using kde and these are these are my gadgets so i have a cpu load monitor network monitor these are my system load bars memory status and hard disk usage right so coming back to the topic what we have is this so the do while loop gives you an advantage where you can execute your loop at least once uh well which, which you can do again by tweaking the conditions the initialization and comparison conditions and to be honest there is really no difference if you uh if we talk about the difference from the compilation perspective right at the end of the day the result is the same the assembly code generated is the same if you are disassembling something and there is a loop you will not be able to tell whether it is a for loop it is a while loop it is a do while loop but even i would not be able to tell that so the thing is loop is one thing it's just we have three different syntaxes depending upon the requirements so i think that is clear right okay so moving out moving on to another object uh, objective which is to add all the numbers from one to that number let's just use the for loop because that is the easiest or the simplest method and we will have another uh, number another uh, thing which will have which will store our result and let's just set the sum to zero because initially the sum is zero and uh, let's say sum equals to sum plus number right because uh, initially the number is one so the sum is zero plus one now when the number is two we have to add one plus two right so one is already inside the sum and we are adding two so it will be three so that way and at the end of the day I just print f sum is uh, percent d and let's just do sum right so gcc loop the number is 10 and i think 1 to 10 is okay i think there is a problem somewhere in my code There must be some problem to be honest okay let's just print it again so some and let's just say number 
Do you print the values of i also? Yes, I am also printing the values of i. So let's see what is happening here. And okay, so it has for some reason multiplied those values. Oh yes, yeah, so, uh, unfortunately I had to use i. And I use the sum, so GCC. And now the sum is 55 as expected. So um, I was using a value number here and therefore it was you know adding number 10 times because the, loop, the number was 10. So that is why the sum was coming out to be 100 but i have to add i because i is the number so one plus zero plus one then plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six plus seven plus eight so this is how you add all the numbers from one to that number now you can do any other thing to be honest you can do anything with the loop uh, you can yeah thank you very much so uh, another thing is uh, you can calculate the sum by using while loop do while loop right it will not make any difference but it would serve as a little exercise if you are interested in kind of practicing and that is everything for today which we decided and it really took more time than i expected i did not think it would even take an hour but it took about 2.5 hours right so any questions before we end this session for today, right? Okay, great, thank you. So uh, before closing, what I have to say is, yeah, thank you very much for the feedback. Now, so Animesh has shared a link uh, to the feedback form, which is uh, by the name InfoSec Trainer. Uh, you can find it in the chat. And I think let me just copy paste it again to everyone. Just a second. Yeah. So this, okay. just a second. Uh, let me share you the code. Yeah. this is the feedback form which you have to fill after the session so we can evaluate uh, the quality of the session and how did you like it what you did not like it and everything like that so i would say please go ahead everyone and fill the feedback form so that we can improve the quality of our sessions as well as uh, the code files will be shared with people who will fill the feedback form so if you want to practice and if you want to ask for the code files go ahead and fill the feedback form right anyways Uh, yes, so you have three exercises for today. First one is uh, you remember uh, when I input minus 10 in unsigned character as the input, it said the age is 248. So the question is why did it say the age is 248 when I am inputting minus 10, right? So the first question is that thing. Second question is to implement the same objective of the loop in the form of while and do while loop. So these are the two exercises for now. And from next sessions, uh, next sessions, what we are planning is uh, once we are once we have covered the talk, for example, 
uh, after the talk we will be sharing a proper exercise questions with you guys with the code files for the session right so the, you will have the exercises in return with you and in case you have any questions we are going to cover or we are going to talk about those questions in the next session okay so general loops take more time in execution so any suggestions from you and the usage of level of loops okay loops take more time in execution so suggestion okay see the thing is if you are using a nested loop for example a loop inside a loop and where you just cannot do this you cannot solve the problem without a loop inside a loop then you cannot do anything right the basic idea is optimization really depends upon the data set if there is a direct relation between something and something which can be solved without using two levels of loops but with a single level of loop that's great in case Uh, there is no direct relation between uh, a connection uh, between two data values so what happens is well you have to write nested loops so it really depends on the data set okay hi everyone uh, i guess it's uh, almost 2 and 20 minutes yes okay so let's wrap it here and uh, we'll continue from the next time okay guys we already shared feedback form and it didn't receive any feedbacks so this time we have a new rule for the codes if you want those codes that Manchi is showing up if you want those things if you have to fill up that feedback form okay you fill up the feedback form and you will get the code in your email that's that simple okay so if you already filled up the form, you might be getting this co uh, code by tomorrow morning because I guess my email server is down. I have to look into that one. Okay, so I hope you guys enjoyed the session and we'll see you on Wednesday. The next session is uh, scheduled for that day. Okay, so if you got any questions, anything, fingers, or you can just go and look for uh, Himansha. Can you pull up that website that we have? Parishti.live. Just a second. Uh, just click on your C programming for hackers. Oh, that is not updated yet. So uh, Himanshu have an email address. It's Himanshu at Aristi.live. You can drop mail directly to that email address and he will be answering on that. If you have any other queries or questions, drop it to hello at Aristi.live. I will be taking care of those things. Okay, it will be on photo. And the session is recorded. And uh, um, Chirag, you're not able to do a copy paste feedback link. Don't worry. Uh, if you go to that page, there will be a feedback link available as well. So I guess my automation is crashed for some reason. It will be updated by tonight. So you can just fill up the form and you'll get all those things. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, guys. So thank you. We'll see you on next time. Bye-bye. And have a nice time.